second law of pardon God has given to us. The first being to the alien sinner in obedience to the gospel of Christ where God's located his power to save all men from sin. Romans 1 16. Once one has believed in Christ, repented of sins, confessed one's faith in Christ as the Son of God, and been baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, the Lord adding them to His church. They are, of course, then Christians. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. They are faithful to God. But from time to time, they can sin. Sometimes people just go off into sin with their eyes wide open because that's what they want to do. Some people completely apostatize. They act like they've never been a part of the church and repudiate everything they ever heard about it. But there is a second law of pardon for the member of the church when we sin as Christians. Let me say that Christians labor with all the power within them to learn the truth and live as God directs Christians to live. Being human, they will sin from time to time and nothing more than that, ignorance or weakness of the flesh. And yet when you read 1 John 1, 7 and specifically verse 8, you see that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Now, we often assume confession of one's public sins is necessary. But they do so without much thought about it. Now that doesn't mean because they assume it they're wrong. It's just that when we do something, even though it's right and taught by the Bible, over a long period of time, if we don't watch out, we do it simply because we've been doing it. And we don't think about the authority of God's word behind what we're doing. So we assume certain things. Or else we just don't think about it at all. But as in all religious and moral matters, as you well know, we must have our Lord's authority found in the New Testament behind what we believe and what we practice for us to be acceptable to Him. And that's true once we become Christian. Well, as a child of God, I'm very interested in the public confession of sin. And I want to study for a while with you concerning the matter of uh, is public confession of sin authorized by the Scriptures? That's the important point. Is it obligatory? Is it necessary? If it is authorized... Is such confession of sin an expedient? There are certain passages that relate to this. And the first one is found in Acts chapter 8, verses 18 through 24. Here's the account of the conversion of Simon the sorcerer in the work of Philip in Samaria, along with many others. Simon, of course, sees how that Philip was able to work miracles through the laying on of the apostles' hands when Peter and John go down to Samaria. And he sins by desiring to have the same power of the apostles. And notice verse 18, And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. 
Now this passion is, uh, pa passage is often used as a proof text to authorize public confession of sin. However, notice that this passage says not one thing in the world about an assembly of the Lord's church. And this was an acknowledgement of sin on Simon's part after it was pointed out to him by the Apostle Peter in the conversation between Peter and Simon and Simon and Peter. So keep that in mind. Now look with me to 1 John 1, 9, which I mentioned a moment ago. John writes, if we, that's the church, Christians, confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you don't see anything here about a confession of sins to an assembly of the church. You do see a confession of sin to God who all sin is ultimately and first of all against. The context is about confessing our sin to the one who can forgive sin and that's God. And you'll see that reflected in Psalm 32 in verse 5. The next verse that we want to examine is found in James chapter 5 and verse number 16. There James instructs Christians to confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Well, of course, this passage is certainly about confessing sin to one another. However, it explicitly, in just so many words, says nothing about confessing one's sins before an assembly of Christians. But, being generic authorization, certainly authorizes such can be done in such an assembly, but not limited to such an assembly. And the last verse among verses people appeal to, to proof text, is 1 Timothy 6 and verse 12. And 1 Timothy 6, 12 reads, Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on eternal life. Paul says to Timothy, Whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Well, this is a public confession, but it's confession of one's faith in Jesus Christ. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. It's not a confession of one as a child of God, sin. I wanted to get those before you because I wanted us to make sure that we understand what the text actually say, how we reason with them, and the conclusions that are warranted by the scriptural evidence. So let's consider some ways by which sin can be confessed. We can confess through prayer to God as we've read in 1 John 1 and verse 9. And this, I must emphasize again, is primary. It's always necessary when we sin whatever the sin, ultimately and finally it's against God. Remembering that sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3, 4. Then to the one sinned against Matthew 5 23 verse 24 I remember one time that brother Woods told about brother G.K. Wallace preaching a gospel meeting where brother Woods was preaching this would be back in the early 40s or late 1930s and there was a lady who responded to the invitation a member of the church and when uh, she was consulted, sitting on the front pew, she wanted to confess another lady's sins. Well, it won't work that way. Uh, so we're interested, and if you've offended somebody, then yes, that person needs to know that uh, you want to be forgiven. You're sorry. You have broken God's law in your dealings with that person or persons, as the case may be. And that means, too, that the one who has been sinned against ought then to forgive the offender. Luke 17, verse 3. It is just as bad and as much a sin not to forgive one whom God has forgiven as it is to commit any sin of any kind as far as separating you from God. 
And then we could uh, confess our sins to a small group, whatever a small group is, I guess at least two. If we can confess to one, we can confess to two. If we can confess to two, we can confess to three. And if we can confess to three and so on and so forth. So that would bring us then to the fact that we could confess our sins to an assembly of the Lord's church, such as this one. If we confess to a group, we can confess to a big group, which is called an assembly. And there is no certain number there. Now the next is, uh, why or should this be done? First of all, sin is so terrible, I don't think any of us, even in the church, even the faithful, can really realize its enormity. I wish more and more that I saw sin as God sees sin. I try to remind myself how God sees sin. For those who die guilty of sin, hell awaits. That's permanent. It's beyond our minds to know the horrors of hell. And you never get out of it. There is no expectation of relief. On the other hand, when I considered how far God went in His love for us to save us from hell, I began to appreciate more what sin is in God's eyes. Sin is the only thing, and I don't know how many times I repeat this, that can keep you out of hell, or rather out of heaven. Sin is the only thing. The transgressing of God's law. I may not like your tie or your haircut or how the sound of your voice. I may not like what you like to eat. I may not like um, the decor of your living room. I may not like the car you buy. I may not this. I may not that. None of that is going to keep you out of heaven. All things being scripturally equal. Only transgressing God's law and dying unforgiven will keep you out of heaven and will definitely assign you a place in torment forever. We in the church need to be mindful of the difference in brethren who sin and will not repent and those that do things we just may not like. Now every member of the church because we are brothers and sisters in the family of God. And there's so few of us when it comes to this world. I ought to be listening to the Apostle John, the Apostle Love, when he over and over again, such as in 1 John, says, Brethren, love one another. Little children, love one another. But the way sometimes we treat one another, it's anything but showing we care about anybody but ourselves. And can you really think that that wouldn't be a problem today in view of the me, 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 me generation we live in? A whole lot of the problems we face in ourselves, our individual selves, our persons, our families, and throughout the nation is because I'm trying to make everything go just like I like it. I don't like this furniture. I don't like this carpet. I don't like the fans. I don't like your looks. Should get amen there. Because see, we both looked at one another. But when we try to say it's got to be like I want it, and if not, I'll have a breakdown. And I must have a safe room. Brethren, that, that is real. It is not wholesome. It's contrary to what God wants a person to be. God wants us to be what the Bible says. That's the way you develop the character of Christ. There is no other way. So when it comes to our sins, there's got to be a humble attitude. And when you see that you've transgressed God's will, whether it's omission or commission, you humble yourself. Wow, we sing that song with the young people, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. What are we singing? Do you believe you ought to humble yourself? Or can you afford to admit that you sin? You, you, I can't afford to 
Well, I cover the ground I stand on. I'm, I'm righteous. I can't admit I've sinned. Well, just by being that way, you've committed about as big a sin as the Lord ever dealt with, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. So we need to acknowledge sin. We need to affirm repentance. I've studied repentance a lot with this congregation and wherever I've had the opportunity. And I've emphasized till I'm uh, gray-headed. I'll let it that way. That'll work. I've emphasized till I'm gray-headed that the actual act of repentance is a breaking down of your old stubborn will that's a seat of all sin and rebellion against God. That's the most accurate definition I can say. Your will is your greatest enemy. It's my greatest enemy. I must submit my will to God in any and all situations. The thing that stands out more about Jesus Christ in my mind than anything else is that it did not make any difference what he was going through. He would keep the commandments of God and nothing moved him to stop him from willing to do God's will. No amount of pain, no amount of mockery, no amount of ridicule, no amount of personal slander, nothing would stop him from willing to render obedience to God. And aren't you glad that he did? Don't you rejoice? We sang song this morning about Christ. So we must acknowledge sin, but it must be from a heart of repentance. The confession of sin is the way that one begins to see this man is recognized as sin, or this woman, or this boy or girl, and is wanting to turn away from it. That's the way it begins. How would you know if somebody doesn't confess it? So brethren will know what's past is in the past. Galatians 1.13, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. The sin may be known to others. And sometimes we don't know how far that public sin may have gone. And because we want to be sure that we do not bring reproach upon the blood bought body of Christ, upon our brothers and sisters, then we confess it publicly to the church. Sin cannot be condoned, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 2. That's where you have the man who had his father's wife. Paul says that kind of sin is not so much as named among the Gentiles, and in Corinth that is something else, because that was about as rank a immoral place as there was in the Roman Empire. And it couldn't be condoned. One of the things that has always hurt the church has been the toleration of sin in members and not doing what the Bible says to bring them to repentance. We mentioned this the other night, or at least in one class. You don't want to hurt people's feelings. But we don't mind hurting God's feelings. We don't mind casting dispersions against Christ that only a moment ago we observed the memorial feast showing forth his death till he come again. We don't mind saying things that cut God to the core. And we're his children. And we think terribly when our own children treat us bad as parents. Well, if I can understand that as a mere weak human, what about God? What did God ever do to be treated like we treat him? Except he's done good. Done good beyond my mind to know what good is and the love he had for us to save us from our sins. Because Jesus came in and said, you can't do it, I will. And he did. Tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin. So sin can't be condoned and the church needs to live in such a way as that we don't condone it, number one, beginning in my own life. Do you allow yourself to keep sin in your life, one or more? doesn't make them time any. And are you trying to think in such a way as that this is not so bad? But where in the Bible did you learn that any sin is not so bad? 
How do we make this effective? Our last point here. How do we make this effect effective? I said earlier that those who have sinned and truly repent of their sins and confess them, the brethren must forgive them. We, we want to forgive. You know God wants to forgive everybody. Well, then why would members of His Son's spiritual body that He purchased with His own blood want to forgive our brethren? You know, that doesn't mean when you forgive somebody that they're your best friends. I think sometimes we think, well, if they're not like my mother or daddy to me or my children to me, then I don't love them like I ought to. That's because we don't know the love of God is presented in the Scriptures. The highest form of love that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 13, agapao or agape as we most of the time know it, seeks another's highest good. Now let me ask you something. What is the highest good you can seek for your wife? Heaven. That means you seek the road God's laid out for you to get her to heaven. Same thing concerning the husband, parents to their children, and brothers and sisters in Christ. Well, that straight and narrow way can pinch sometimes. You're not helping anybody by caressing them and letting them stay doing things contrary to God's will. As a preacher, I grow weary of other preachers. Not all of them, of course. But preachers, above all, are in a position to change people. What is a preacher to do as God defines a preacher of the gospel other than change people by what he teaches? Now, get this down. The church is fundamentally a teaching institution. We don't go out with baseball bats and scimitars and AK-47s and say convert or else. You appeal to people through the truth, through the Word of God, and you reason with them. And when they're in the state of one person at this particular time, you couldn't reason with them. And you need to recognize that too. It is fruitless to reason with people who are irrational and work at being irrational. If the truth will not reach people, then they can't go to heaven. Impossible for God to save them. So don't, let's not convince ourselves that we can tolerate and put up with sin, but let us also be willing to forgive somebody and let us realize that you don't have to be best buddies to will somebody the ultimate good, and that means doing whatever you can to get them to do what God told them and the way God told them to do it and for the reason God told them to do it or even sometimes when He told them to do it, if such is in the Scriptures regarding our duty to Him. So when people commit sins that bring reproach upon the blood-bought body of Christ, what people are they? They're members of the same body they're bringing reproach on by their actions. Now, they don't know how far that's gone. So if they're humble and they recognize it because they can only repent of the sin they recognize, you can't, you can't repent of that which you don't realize you've done. That's one reason Peter said to Simon, the former sorcerer, as a Christian when he sinned. He called it to his attention. What you're desiring is contrary to God's will. You don't have a part in this. Now that was a civil request from a relatively new convert. But he said, repent therefore of this thy wickedness. Why, if we were to talk to some new converts, truly converted, truly taught how to become Christians, and say that, well, we'd do a double backflip. Well, some of us would, some of us couldn't if we wanted to. But that's what Peter, inspired of the Holy Spirit, an apostle of Jesus Christ, said to one, and I can just see if uh, <laughs> Philip standing over there, if he's like some preachers, oh, I worked so hard and get this fellow to obey the gospel and look what he was doing to the public out here with his magician tricks and now we've got him converted and you say this to him. Why, you don't love him and where is your kindness and all this stuff? That's us in the church. Folks, that's one reason we don't convert some of the people we're around. We don't confront them with the sins that are sending them to hell. Now, somebody ought to be repenting of that, it seems to me. I'm talking about members of the church. And then we don't have people acting like 
like uh, Paul urged and taught the church at Corinth to act toward the man who had his father's wife. They said they were puffed up about it. Letting it go right along, doing nothing about it. There was a time in my naive young life as a preacher that I just couldn't understand how brethren could do that. That passed me a long time ago. Brethren can learn to justify themselves in any heinous sin there is. First of all, I didn't need to experience it. I'd already read it in my Bible that people do that. So, even a man like Paul and Peter, when Peter sins, Paul withstood him to the face. The Greek there, by the way, means mouth to mouth. And I've often thought, Paul just gave Peter spiritual what? What do you call that? When you give mouth to mouth what? Resuscitation. That's exactly what he did when he stood him to the face because Paul said Peter was to be blamed. You know, we don't want to blame anybody today except somebody else for my mistakes. And that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve, doesn't it? The woman thou gave us me, she did give me, and I did eat. Which really meant, since you gave me the woman, God, if you hadn't given me the woman, then I wouldn't have eaten the fruit. For she wouldn't have been here to tempt me. Never mentions a thing about where were you in the head of the race handling your own affairs when it comes to this kind of thing. Then you got some people, and we'll have to close after this, who have the idea that, well, if you take one bite of the forbidden fruit, that's all right. Just as long as you don't eat the whole fruit. Now, let me ask you something. Did Eve take just one bite? And maybe it was called a nibble? Or did she eat half of it? Or did she eat the whole thing? Core and all, if it had a core. Before she transgressed God's law. all it would take in one bite however big the bite was and she's violated God's will but the way we think and the devil knows how we think then we justify ourselves if we haven't gone too far into sin then that's alright doesn't work that way sin is the transgression of the law it's doing that which we have no New Testament authority to do it's leaving undone what we're obligated to do you die that way you lose your soul that's the fact of the matter. Nothing in the Bible goes against what I said. Now, if somebody wants to try to find a passage that goes against what I just stated, I welcome the opportunity to deal with it. Paul wrote to the person who had repented, sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many, so that contrary wise he ought rather to forgive him and comfort him lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Wherefore, I, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him, that you've forgiven him. He's done what God required of him to get that forgiveness, God's second law of pardon. He's confessed his sins. The whole church knows it. Now deal with him properly. Don't keep bringing it up to him. Don't keep slapping him on the head with it as if he's still in it and has not repented. And notice he says, which was inflicted of many. The whole church was involved in this. And that's what it takes when it comes to this kind of discipline to bring people to repentance. God knows what's best for us, folks. We just have to learn that he does and then decide to follow his will. So, for the person, as we always say at the end of our sermons, who's a member of the church, it's sinned. If your sins are brought reproached on the blood-bought body of Christ, then you need to repent of those sins Confess them and pray God for forgiveness. Sins known only to you and God can be taken care of in the same way. Sins maybe that took place within the family and only your family knows about it. Maybe it's only between a husband and a wife. Maybe it's before wife or husband and children. Take care of it right there. But when you don't know how far your sin's gone in the public to bring reproach on your own brothers and sisters in Christ, you need before the congregation to make a public confession evidencing your repentance. Now we studied at the beginning what to do to become a Christian. We spent all this time speaking to Christians on what they need to do to gain forgiveness of sins once they sin. And now we have this invitation song we're going to sing to encourage you to respond. And so we ask that you to do so if you need while we stand and sing.